Yesterday I did a community post and I want to go over it because not everybody sees these. Uh, I'm trying to do these succinct little posts, you know, and again, we're not arguing with the dogs. They're, they are not listening. I got more comments today than in a long time from people who are just clearly lord shippers. No matter what they say, they're lord shippers. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, the, so, you know, the new covenant is, is the blood of Jesus. You're blaspheming, you know. To say it's a secondary issue is blaspheming. Um, no, the, the blood of Jesus is the blood of Christ, and it's the blood of the everlasting covenant, and it's also the blood of the new covenant. Again, none of them ever talk about the everlasting covenant, and in saying that we are Israel in order to adopt the new covenant, they're denying the everlasting covenant and depriving Christ, doctrinally at least, of his inheritance, which in fact does undercut your salvation and is blasphemous, we don't call them blasphemers for doing them. We just call them morons because they don't. They've had this information for two years and have been arguing about it for two years. And yet not one of them has addressed the new covenant uh, versus the everlasting covenant at all. At all. Okay. Which is the main point we're trying to make is we want to direct people to the covenant that the father made with the son, the everlasting covenant that actually everything is based on the new covenant as well as individual justification and everything we have is based on the everlasting covenant and it is ignored by these people uh i wouldn't say it's denied i say it's just ignored because they're so focused on israel's new covenant uh and look at the good fruit of these beautiful people with their beautiful new hearts isn't it isn't it marvelous um and, you know, maybe I will start leaving some of their... Because a lot of people say, oh, I didn't see this argument. I didn't know what was... A maybe I should leave these comments on our wall from our supposed brothers in Christ. Then you'd see what's going on uh, out there in the wild, wild west of YouTube. But my uh, post... This is kind of short. It just says, Individual salvation, inheritance, and justification has always been prior to Christ's coming and now after his resurrection based on the everlasting covenant that God made with Christ. The blood of Christ is also the blood of the everlasting covenant, not just the blood of the new covenant. And by the way, it's the belief in the blood of Christ that saves me, not the blood of a covenant. It's the blood of Christ that makes the covenant valuable. And it's the blood of Christ and believing his blood that saves me. It's not believing in a covenant that saves me. It's believing in the blood of Christ. If you don't believe that's the blood of Christ, you can't be saved even if you do believe it's the blood of a covenant. Uh, it makes him... So the everlasting covenant is mentioned in Hebrews 13, 20, where it says, Now, the, uh, now uh, that God raised Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the everlasting covenant. Okay? And uh, it contains, the, the everlasting covenant contains a command for the sheep, shepherd, to lay his life down for the sheep. That's John 10, 8, where he's, 18, where he says, uh, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down to myself, this commandment I've received from my father. That's according to this covenant he received in eternity past as the son of God. This covenant, the everlasting covenant, is first seen in the scripture. Well, second, we, we see it in the covenant with Noah where he made a covenant that he would never judge the earth again with a flood. And he did that for Christ's sake. That's actually a covenant made with Noah's seed, Christ, to give him the earth for his kingdom. I'm not going to destroy it. Um, and that's called the everlasting covenant. Then we see a covenant made with Abraham's seed, which is also called the everlasting covenant. And Abraham is asleep when the torch and the furnace pass to the pieces and make a covenant and and hebrews 6 tells us that that is god making a covenant with himself and swearing an oath because he could swear no, by no greater he actually confirmed it with himself not that he had to do that for his sake because god is one but for our sake to guarantee to the heirs the immutability of the promise he swore by an oath uh surely i will bless it you. So, and that has become an anchor for our soul, it says in Hebrews 6, and by that uh, oath, 
Christ has been made a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek forever. So our salvation and the high priesthood of Christ is actually tucked into the Abrahamic covenant and the oath. Um, it's really interesting, according to Hebrews 6. Now, ultimately, we see it with the Davidic covenant, but Abraham's seed is David's seed, and it's Christ. But the everlasting covenant was confirmed 430 years prior to the Mosaic covenant, which is the law, and it was confirmed by God in Christ. Uh, Galatians 3.17 makes this argument. It says, now the law, which was 430 years after the covenant God be confirmed before in Christ, cannot disannul or make that covenant void. It can't add conditions to it so that it could disqualify the heirs for their inheritance. When the, uh, so that covenant was confirmed when the torch and the furnace passed through the pieces of Abraham's sacrifice while he slept. And that, by the way, was when Abraham was justified. It was believing God's promise at the time that God cut that covenant uh, that a justification comes out of. And Abraham was asleep. He had nothing to do with it. It was a covenant confirmed in Christ between the Father and the Son. Also, that covenant appoints Christ, who is the seed of Abraham, uh, the heir of all the promises. So Galatians 3.16 says, when God spoke, you know, I will bless your seed, he didn't speak of many seeds, he spoke of one, which is Christ. And Galatians 3.19 says that the law, 430 years later, was added for transgressions until the seed should come to who the promise is made, which is Christ. Okay, so the Mosaic Covenant was a temporary covenant added for transgressions later until Christ comes to inherit the promise. Remember when he said to the Pharisees, you know, he talked about the vineyard, and he said, you know, the landowner has a vineyard and he goes away and he leaves it to the stewards or the vine dressers and he sends some prophets or his servants to see how it's doing and they beat him and send him back so he sends his son saying surely they'll listen to him and they say oh behold the heir let's kill him so we can steal the inheritance and jesus was talking about himself and that they were still trying to steal the kingdom for themselves and have it without the one to whom it was promised okay he is the heir, not any of us. And it's according to this everlasting covenant. This covenant contains the promises to the seed of Abraham regarding his multiplication. And Christ is multiplied as the sands of the earth, sands of the seashore, which has an earthly component, and the stars of heaven, which has an earthly, a heavenly component, represented by Israel and the church. Uh, and he's literally multiplied in the church by the giving, well, really in both, by the giving of his spirit. Uh, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The death of the grain of wheat is its, and its resurrection as a harvest is its multiplication. We are the multiplication of Christ. And the in the future, Israel, the remnant that is saved during the tribulation, will receive his spirit as well. And they will be like the sand of the seashore uh, on the earth. will be like the stars of heaven. There's an earthly glory and a heavenly glory. Uh, it contains promises to the seed of Abraham regarding his multiplication, the land. The land is really Christ's. Yes, it's divided into different uh, portions for his brothers, or, you know, the sons of Jacob, but Christ is the only one who can possess it. And that's why John wept when he saw that no one could open the scroll, right? But they said, don't worry. <laughs> uh, the Lamb of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll. And he comes forth, and what does he take? The title deed of the earth. And, and especially the land, which is that seven-sealed scroll in Revelation 5. And the book of Revelation is about Christ taking his inheritance, the earthly portion of it. He's already got the heavenly portion, which is the church and the throne of God. Uh, but anyway, it contains the promises to the seed of Abraham regarding his multiplication, 
the land, that it'll be a blessing. He's going to be a blessing to all the nations. The inheritance of his most excellent name, I'll make your, your name great, right? The Hebrew says he's inherited a more excellent name than even the angels. This is a man, okay? As the son of God, he already had the excellent name. Jehovah, I am. But now, as a man, as the seed of Abraham, he's been born of a woman, and that man, on our behalf, has partaken of flesh and blood and entered into all of this as an inheritance to share with us. And that man has been given a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, including the angels. They worship him. And he sits at the right hand of God. This is all according to these covenants. Uh, he has the, ever, now, okay, um, so that's the inheritance of his excellence name. I'll make your name great. And those who bless you will be blessed, and those who curse you will be cursed. That's right. At your eternal destiny hangs on what you do with this man, Jesus Christ, this God-man. Uh, now, the, the eternal, the everlasting covenant also contains the promises to the seed of David regarding his being the son of God. Now, this is in 2 Samuel 7. I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. Uh, and that's talking about the fact that this man inherited the sonship. And uh, Romans 1, 3 and 4 says that the gospel is concerning Christ, who was born the seed of David according to the flesh, but declared to be the Son of God with power by the Spirit of Holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. In his resurrection, he inherited all these promises as the seed of David, as the man, and his humanity was glorified. It's his humanity that inherited all this. Uh, and he will have the, so he's the son of God as a man, the firstborn of many brethren. Uh, he's the ever, he has an everlasting throne that he will sit on forever. And by the way, Gabriel promised that when he came and visited Mary, the throne of David, his father. That's in Jerusalem. He's not taken possession of that throne yet. He's sitting on his father's throne and he told the church in uh, Thyatira, to him he overcomes, I will give to sit on my throne, even as I have sat on my father's throne. And he shall rule the nations with a rod of iron. Well, that's a promise to the seed of David. The rod of iron and the ruling of the nations is a promise to the seed of David uh, from Psalm 2. That's part of his inheritance, which we are co-heirs. Uh, he will... Uh, have the mercies of David, God says, my, his, my mercies will not depart from him like I took them from Saul. Now, and it says that if he transgresses, I will chastise him with the rod of men. Well, Jesus never sinned, right? But he was chastised with the rod of men. He was scourged for our iniquities. He was bruised uh, for our iniquities and wounded for our transgressions. He was whipped and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. This is where we get substitutionary atonement from. Ours. Okay? It's called the mercies of David. In uh, Isaiah 55, he says, I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. He doesn't mention the new covenant when he talks about the mercies of David. He's talking about the everlasting covenant. Uh, he will sit at the right hand of God and be called God. Now that comes from Psalm 110, which Hebrews quotes and says, you know, to which of the angels says, he said, my God said to my God, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Uh, that is a decree made from God in the Psalms prophetically, a vow to the seed of David. Hebrews 6 says that that is a vow that made Christ uh, high priest according to the order of Melchizedek because the next thing he says in that psalm is thou art a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek and by the way your salvation rests on that his high priesthood is what brings you into the holiest and he intercedes for you if you didn't have that you would fall away And but this guarantees that you won't uh, and that's why the book of Hebrews is so beautiful is because it reveals the high priestly ministry of Christ which Paul says is the meat of the word. 
It's seeing his high priestly ministry and seeing how much he has taken the role upon himself to secure every aspect of the Christian life. He is the Christian life. He gives it to us as bread and wine after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, okay, so he's God. He's the son of God. He has the throne. He has the land. He's multiplied. He's inherited the name, right? He has the everlasting throne. Uh, I already said that. He's going to build the house of God. He's faithful as a son over his house. According to Hebrews 3, which is the... Uh, Moses was faithful over his house, but Christ is a son, faithful over his house, whose house we are because of the faith. And we are built up to be a habitation of God in spirit. The foundation uh, is the testimony, the prophets and the apostles, and the cornerstone is Christ himself. We are built in him. This is his work. Uh, all of these things are these two covenants, the covenant with the seed of Abraham and the covenant of the seed of David, which are two aspects of the everlasting covenant. So our great salvation is tied up in the fact that Christ is the seed of Abraham, the seed of David, the son of God, according to the everlasting covenant. The blood of Christ is the everlasting, is the blood of the new covenant, and the blood of the everlasting covenant. Can those who are blathering on and on about the new covenant tell you anything about the everlasting covenant? The covenant confirmed in Christ, the covenant with Abraham's seed, or the Davidic covenant. While it is not required that you understand these things to be saved, to persist in denying them will eventually lead to gospel problems as we are seeing. Meanwhile, the new covenant is a replacement for the Mosaic covenant. And you can clearly see that when it's laid out. It's not like the covenant I made with, their, with your fathers. Who are the fathers? The children of Israel in the wilderness. Those are not our fathers as the church. They broke that covenant. I'm going to make a new covenant with them. Who? The house of Israel and Judah. Uh, okay, so in order to say that we are under the new covenant, they have to say that we are Israel. To make the church part of a new covenant, they have to say we are Israel. And that then becomes a denial. See, they had to allegorize then the promises that God made to the seed of David and the seed of Abraham and say, no, he's not going to inherit that land. No, he's not going to literally have that throne. No, he's not going to literally possess the nations as an inheritance and rule them with a rod of iron. No, we're not going to rule the nations with a rod of iron on the earth. Right? They have to allegorize all these promises away and say the kingdom is in our heart. What are they doing? They are stealing Christ's inheritance. They're denying his inheritance. They're denying... Uh, they're denying what gives us our salvation while calling us blasphemers for denying the new covenant. See the irony? So it's a denial of the literal promises to the seed of Abraham and the seed of David. And I said, you can hate us all you want, but do you hate us so much that you'll want to, that you'll become a Roman Catholic or a Calvinist to do so? I tried to read this fast. I'm not good at it. Uh, they, they're steeped, steeping themselves in Calvinist and Catholic doctrine. And the irony is that most of these channels started out as rapture watching channels. And again, if we are Israel, get ready because we're going through the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. If we're Jacob, we'll be here, right? And not only that, but if we are Jacob, then God bringing Israel back into the land is irrelevant. And we are not in the end times. There is no end times because there's no literal fulfillment of the prophecies. Now, if they try to tell you that, oh yeah, the prophecies are going to be fulfilled, but this is also, this is ours, then now they've got to get really complicated to do that. Uh, and the only reason they would do that is so that they can launch accusation against certain people and say they're not saved, which is sick. All right, take care.